Hello everyone and welcome to your um, tutorial. Today we'll be learning how to interpret graphs and tables. And uh, as the title suggests, this has obviously a lot of real life implications, especially when you're reading research papers and you're trying to make sense of the graphs and tables. And basically this is the activity for today's tutorial is after I cover the basic interpretations of graphs and tables, um, you would be going and you would be reviewing three articles and trying to make um, a sense and conclusion of the tables and the graphs which are reported in your research paper. So select research papers um, which have graphs, which have tables so that you can um, apply and practice the skills. Right, so we'll get started. So types of graphs, um, yes, there are uh, various types of graphs which are listed over here and we'll be going through um, all of these. So yes, graphs, um, what's their basic um, purpose? They are pictorial format representation of um, the data that you're trying to explain and graphs should be self-explanatory um, that um, they should speak for themselves. All right, so the first one and the most common one that is used in health science is histogram. So yes, histogram generally what is reported is uh, the proportion or the percentage within the histogram. The um, X axis, it cons uh, consists of a continuous variable or it's a categorical one. I'll show you examples of both, all right? And the Y axis generally represents the proportion in terms of say the percentage, the number, the count, or else um, so proportion is say your number or count of frequency or else it's a percentage form, all right? Your Y axis. So now if we look at um, the example over here, this is the frequency which is reported and this is the age of participants, all right? And as you can see, um, it also gives you a bit of summary statistics, which is mean and standard deviation of the population and the N value. So the sample size is 224, uh, the mean age, and this is in years, which is 14 years and um, 14, yep, yeah, yeah, 14 years, 0.42, yes, 14.42 years, and the standard deviation is 1.605. Okay, so yep, uh, this is for a continuous variable, meaning the age is not categorized. The age is as it is, uh, 10 years, 12 years, 14 years, 16 years, so on and so forth, okay? And um, this is the frequency over here, which is reported. And this is in terms of percentages, because this is from my own data set. Uh, so, um, for example, uh, if you have say individuals who are, or participants who are say 12 years of age, uh, the frequency is say um, a bit less than 30%, okay? Of participants are say 12 years of age and the exact number is given over here, which is 28, all right? So yes, this, uh, um, this the uh, little boxes inside, they represent uh, the uh, proportion, all right? Which is the number of participants which I had and um, as you can see, this is a bimodal distribution. So bimodal meaning having two peaks. So the um, 14 years is the maximum peak, which is with 52 um, individuals. And 16 years is the second peak, which is with 39 individuals. All right. So um, yes, so as you can see over here, when I say um, bimodal meaning, a majority of the individuals in this um, sample are 14 years and 16 years. So there are two peaks over here, all right? And um, basically when you have bimodal distribution, what does it mean? It means that maybe the uh, population or the sample which you have sourced, it is coming from two distinct group. And yes, it is because when we did this study, we, um, we had gone to schools and in schools, a majority of the children were say a 14 and um, less, a majority uh, meaning the classes that we had selected. And there were two classes that we had selected, which were uh, senior years, and therefore the children were 16 years and um, above. All right, so yes, more classes which were 14 and under and few classes which were 16 and above. So yes, therefore we had these two distinct group because the um, recruitment was done from uh, this uh, classes age group, okay? Um, so yep, um, so that is with your continuous variable and I hope it makes sense. It's pretty self-explanatory and this can be normally distributed or not normally distributed. Therefore, you always follow histogram with the best practice of identifying normal distribution like your KSSW test um, if applicable uh, for say, um, remember it is um, not for a very small sample size, all right? 
and I would also be checking for um, the uh, deviation between the mean and the median, which was taught to you, and the skewness and the kurtosis. Okay, so I would be checking all of that before making a decision whether I should use this variable for parametric test or whether I should log transform this variable for my use, so on and so forth. Okay. And uh, yes, uh, just one more thing uh, I realized, a quick correction students, is that this frequency is just in no terms of proportion, not percentages. I accidentally said percentages, but it is proportions. So proportion meaning actual count, just the count. So for example, if you have say 52 individuals who are 14 years of age, so this is say a little bit higher than 50 and therefore it is 52, okay? So this is in terms of proportions, not percentages. So please excuse me for that. So yes, and this graph is produced through SPSS, but of course you can um, have graphical representation to Excel through Excel sheets as well, okay? But remember histograms to be followed uh, with um, your normal distribution um, actual test like KS, SW, so on and so forth. Okay, so now, yes, you can have histograms even for categorical variable. So uh, let's break down the age group of these school children that we had studied. So now we have 10 to 12, 13 to 15, and 16 to 18. So there are three um, age groups of children, all right? And therefore, over here, now age is again, um, you can say on the x axis, but it is now three categories. Therefore, you have three bar charts representing three categories of age group. All right. And if you see the frequency over here, 29. 29 children belong to 10 to 12 years of age group. So you have 29 over here, the count belonging to the age group of 10 to 12 years. All right. And similarly, you have 127 children and then you have 68 children. Okay, so basically this is very simple. I have just reported the counts, but you can actually report the percentages as well. And in most research papers, uh, don't be surprised if you find the percentages which is reported, which is and within this SPSS, say um, this output, the percentage that you would be reporting is a valid person. Okay, not the one which has missing system and all, the valid person which actually then accounts to 100%. So it is 13% in the youngest group, then 56.5% in the middle one, and then the 30.5% in the oldest age group. Make sense? Okay. So yes, you can also report percentages in the similar manner. Then your frequency, of course, will change. And this frequency will be not proportions, but percentages. Okay. So yes, as you can see, histogram is used for both continuous variable and categorical variable. You have different types of distribution. So you just have the normal peak shape, then you have the bimodal shape, then you have the skewed distribution, which we spoke about the left and the right skewed. That one is there. Okay, and with histogram, don't just rely on histogram. If you're checking normality distributions, please follow this up with appropriate tests that have been advised earlier. Okay, then you have frequency polygon, not very, um, say, widely used, especially in nutrition research. I don't speak about all health sciences. Maybe it is used in your uh, faculty, but not very widely used in nutrition research. It is similar to histogram, but over here, instead of using bars, so like, so like we had all these bar charts over here, instead of the uh, bars, you have lines. Okay, mm -hmm. that's the only difference. And yes, can be used with continuous and with categorical variable as well. Again, your x-axis will report uh, the uh, variable, which is age, for example, and y-axis, the proportion of uh, whatever it is, uh, uh, which is proportion or percentages. Okay. So, yep, um, as you can see, this is your, um, say, uh, the same age, which we had done um, earlier. So, yes, you have the maximum peak at 14 years, and then you have it at 16 years. This is continuous variable x-axis, and this is your count or your proportion, all right, which is on your y-axis. And as you can appreciate histogram, they can only depict one variable at a time, all right? So this is only for age. Then you'll have something like this for say uh, BMI, um, yes, BMI. And then you'll have the third one, which would be for say vitamin D blood levels, something like that, okay? So I hope this makes sense. So frequency polygon looks like this, can be done for continuous. And as you can see in this slide, it can also be done for categorical variable. Again, it's the same thing. You have th three age group, 10 to 12, 13 to 15, and 16 to 18. And we knew that um, 13 to 15, they had the majority number of children, all right? And again, you have your uh, proportion or your counts over here or your frequencies. And then over here in your x-axis, you have the age group, okay? 
then you have pyramid and we have um, understood the interpretation of pyramid when we were doing the uh, very first um, we were, when we were doing the very first lecture when i spoke about age standardized uh, mortality distribution um, and which was for um, incidences of lung cancer rate among uh, say uh, various countries males and females right so as um, i have uh, as i have explained earlier the same thing applies over here majority of the time pyramids are used for population level uh, they uh, can represent uh, say um, two variables at a time for example age but bifurcated as gender for example all right so yes two variables can be represented and uh, generally uh, the frequency distribution which is shown it is in terms of percentages and sometimes it could be proportion but majority of that time it is percentages okay so yes um, as you can see over here uh, this is the age group which is given this is for males and females and uh, then it is the interpretation is the same which i explained to you with the um, data earlier all right in your uh, week one lectures okay so i hope this is simple enough because um, it has the exact same interpretation as what we studied with the age standardized um, mortality rates all right or incidence rate it was for lung cancer okay and uh, similarly um, students um, you can um, i have also spoken about interpretation of um, say your survival analysis like you know how you have your survival graphs so even they count in graphs okay so um, we covered it in the lecture because it made most sense to cover it in the lecture but your survival graphs are one more type of graphs which are not included over here but they have been explained earlier when we were doing survival analysis okay all right so yep uh, this is just an example of uh, say your pyramid structure but you have had a much better example when we were doing the week 1 uh, lecture content okay so over here again the division is male and female this is age of participants for male um, on this y axis on this side it is age of participants for females and as you can see for the older age group all right uh, you and this is continuous variable females are much less you just have one female versus you have 28 uh, males um who are 17 years of age okay um yes so basically and if you see over here another distinction that uh, you have uh, females who are starting much more younger than compared to males males they are starting from 12 years and above but, and um, yes even if you uh, yes 12 years and above but for females it is from 11 years okay so i hope that makes sense okay so it's pretty simple there is not really it's not very difficult to interpret um say univariate uh, graphs univariate meaning just one variable or over here of course it is bivariate meaning uh, age versus gender but they are pretty simple to um say understand interpret and of course if this was a statistical class we would learn how to uh, make these graphs and tables in spss this is just for your fyi where i have written over here that i have made this graph via spss but of course these simplistic graphs can be made even on excel all right okay so now pyramid yes again you can make a pyramid for categorical variable as well so again we have our three age group 10 to 12 13 to 15 16 to 18 all right and uh, then uh, it's the same thing we know we have majority of the children in 13 to 15 years of age group okay and they are relatively um say equal see you have 62 uh, males and you have 65 females okay but see our interpretation in the continuous variable was right that in the older age group which is 16 to 18 years we have a uh, much less females and many more males okay so 15 females versus 53 males and these are just simplistic counts so i have made these graphs particularly to explain to you these basic fundamental concepts for these for the lecture Uh, but of course as i said you can replace these counts with percentages and uh, please be mindful that percentages are what is widely reported but just for your um, basic understanding for you to learn it for the very first time i have made uh, these um, uh, proportions rather than percentages okay so yep yeah, uh, i hope this is simple enough all right then you have box plots so it helps to uh, display again two or more variables and uh, it displays uh, it depends if um, you can do box plots uh, say with means and 95% confidence interval but a lot of time box plots are also um, uh, denoted with your medians and interquartile range all right and you can also have minimum maximum values reported depending upon what you select 
Um, please, please remember that if you want to um, identify an outlier, box plots are the best. Okay, so they will give you this little star when we see the graph. And this little star, you can actually have the individual case number. So like it is participant number 65 is an outlier in this data. And then you can go to participant number 65 and then you can see, oh, accidentally, rather than 18 years of age, you entered 81 years of age. Okay, so it could be say a typo or actually you have one participant who's really older and therefore is an outlier. And then of course, um, then uh, you would be making a decision later on whether the case is an influential case or not. Okay, which is explained to you earlier. All right, but yes, so box plots are the best for identifying outliers. Um, further on, you will see bar charts, um, et cetera, with um, say um, outliers, um, but it does not give you the exact case number. I love um, box plots because they can actually give you the exact case number and it makes your life really simple for you to investigate whether these outliers are influential cases, uh, which you need to include, exclude, do something about. Um, but yes, it helps you to make your statistical decisions. All right. So yeah, Pia, and uh, we can also tell this outlier was male and female, et cetera. Yes, uh, because of the way you make the box plot, it all depends upon the research question and how you are making your box plot. So let me show you an example. So over here, for instance, we have males and females, total number of males and females, 131 males and 93 females. Then you have the median, you have the interquartile range, minimum, maximum. What I have depicted in the box plot, if you see this thick line over here in the center, that is your median, okay? So your median, for example, male is 15. So if you see over here, age of participants, okay? On your y-axis, okay, on your x-axis, you have males and females. So box plot can represent males and females and it has represented age, all right? So you have these two variables in your box plot. Again, you can do bivariate depiction over here. And with age, we know the median age for males is 15 years. Therefore, you have the line over here across 15, okay? And this, if you see, this is your 25th and this is your 75th interquartile range, okay? So similarly, you can have box plots with mean and 95% confidence interval because 95% confidence interval can also give you a depiction of dispersion. So this tells you the dispersion, all right? Always remember the fundamental rule these are called as error bars, okay? These are the error bars and you want shorter error bars, smaller the dispersion, uh, smaller the dispersion or narrower the dispersion, better is the data, okay? Which will give you a stronger, more reliable finding in the future when you actually do analysis with your um, say age as a variable, okay? So I hope that makes sense. Um, so um, yep, uh, basically, you have your median depicted over here. Your error bars are your 95% confidence interval in this example. Okay, this is for males and females and this does not have an outlier, all right? So this is just normal data. Now let's see a data with outlier in box plot, how it looks. Okay, so you see over here um, the um, 65. So this, your star is an outlier. It actually tells you which uh, participant number is an outlier, which is 65. So you can actually go to your main a uh, variable view sheet and you can see 65 and you can see if there is something tricky with age over there. All right, you know it is a uh, participant number 65 male who is an issue, all right? And if you see over here, the minimum age is 12 and the maximum age is 71. And if you see earlier, the minimum age is 12, the uh, maximum age is 17. So maybe there was this sort of a mistake where just while entering you um, swap the numbers, okay? So sometimes it could be a simple mistake like this, or sometimes it could be a much more complicated interpretation, which then you would be obviously consulting with your supervisor, so on and so forth, to see if these are influential cases and if you have to deal with them in a particular manner, okay? Um, so yes, of course, uh, these are again your median and those um, error bars are your interquartile ranges, okay? So all of that stays the same. I just wanted to show you the influence of an outlier, all right? Okay. All right, so with histogram as well, um, you can uh, say identify an outlier, especially if you have age 71, this is how the histogram will look. All of this is all clubbed on one end, all right? Um, and then you have the number of participants, so 83 participants who are 15 years of age, so on and so forth. This is not done for males and females separately. 
this histogram depicts all of the participants together but then you have this one single participant who is in the age range of 70 ish okay and then you would have to investigate further but if you see it does not give you the exact uh, case number whereas over there we had participant id number 65 is the one which is problematic okay that's why i like box um, box plots to identify outliers others can identify but uh, it's most easiest to do it with um, box plots okay so then you have bar charts so bar charts are generally used to display means um, generally used to display means it's not that you cannot do it with medians okay but generally for means all right and um, yes uh, again uh, bar charts if you have to choose if you want to um, examine the frequency of the distribution which is is it say normally distributed so on and so forth please use histograms rather than bar charts okay uh, then um, you uh, yes with bar charts you can um, say have independent mean independent meaning meaning a cross sectional study where each participant is only measured once okay so you have 300 um, say a uh, female students um in your data set and all of these 300 um students are different okay uh, but it can also used to display related means or dependent mean what does that mean it means you have measured uh the height of each student three times okay at three months and at six months and at baseline something like that all right so yes so bar charts can be used to display a uh, dependent means it can used to display independent means but this means can be replaced with a uh, medians Uh, depending upon the type of data you have for example uh, if i had say not normally distributed data from histogram if i find out uh, then the bar chart depiction would uh, then follow up with medians rather than means okay but yeah generally uh, means is what is used for depiction but not always all right so now this bar chart over here it says without outlier okay so you have males the mean age is 14 all right so you have this 14.82 that is the mean age over here this error bar depicts standard deviation okay so that is what is depicted over here as you say error bar is plus slash minus to standard deviation so it depicts your standard deviation and as you know with standard deviation it is the same phenomena a uh, smaller the standard deviation number better is your model okay so standard deviation over here is 1.67 so it has a longer um error bar compared to female which is 1.33 therefore it has a shorter error bar okay and uh, yes of course then you have your um means of your female which is 13.85 all right so this is then with means and standard deviations all right over here also if you see on your y axis you have mean age of participants all right and therefore you are comparing it against this mean age so 14.82 is say somewhere over here okay the um and this can be moved actually if you want to have this box written somewhere else that can be done in spss all right and then yes of course this is again a bivariate um, say data which you are displaying so you have males and females versus the age group okay and then you have bar charts over here uh, with an outlier um and over here it says standard deviations of 5.18 okay but now do you see uh, yes this error bar certainly is much more longer and which would make you um doubt the data as to what is going on all right uh, but um, again it is not as intuitive as box plot all right so for me i always um, use box plot to identify outliers it makes my life much more simple and it's quick and easy all right so yes so over your male mean age is 15.23 so this little white box that is what it depicts the mean age all right yes you can you um you can um, shift the white box depending upon where you want it okay so that is not an issue all right mean age of participants again your uh, y axis can be changed to students okay so for instance you can actually change um, the account over here the decimal count over here um so do you want it to jump by 2 or do you want it to jump by 5 or do you want just a one unit change so all of that can be changed just like how it can be changed on excel okay again your error bars are a depiction of your standard deviation which is said in this um say a uh, uh, footnotes over here okay but yes this is with outlier and yes the error bar is longer but it does not tell me which case number is the problem and things like that in a box plot even if you have five outliers it will give you all of the five asterisks 
with the um, independent um, say case numbers. So that's why um, box plots are excellent for identifying outliers. Okay, this is called as cluster bar charts. Similarly, um, students, you have stacked bar charts. So for example, over here, you have a male, blue, female, green, right? Um, side by side, but you can have it uh, say horizontal, one on top of the other. Okay, so those are called as stacked bar chart and this is called as cluster bar chart, okay? So yep, uh, so you uh, this is uh, for categorical variable that I have done, all right? So you have age, which is categorized into your three groups. Then you have your uh, mean age of participants over here and over here, for instance, with males, you can see that it is 12 years of age is the mean age, female it is 11.92, so on and so forth. So these white boxes, they represent the mean age of participants. And this is your uh, standard deviation, these error bars again, okay? And this is categorized as per gender. So you see there are three variables in this uh, picture. So you have gender categorization, you have age categorization, all right? Um, and um, you have, um, yes, and you have age categories as well. So age as a variable and age categories, okay? So that is how age is divided into two. So age as a variable and then age categories, and then you have your gender, okay? So you have three variables in this cluster bar chart, but remember you also have stacked bar charts and it would be the similar sort of interpretation. Okay, now if you see interestingly, if you see over here with males 10 to 12 years of age, there is no error bar, okay? Why is there no error bar? Um, explanation is there on the next slide. So yes, why is there no error bar for males 10 to 12 years of age, which we just saw in the diagram? Okay, so if you see the mean is 12, for males, there is no standard deviation. Why is there no standard deviation? Because in this example, which I wanted to show you, if you have, for example, over here, uh, you have all of your uh, male participants um, who are say 12 years of age, okay? So all boys are 12 years of age, all right? And there are 16 of these boys and all 16 boys are 12 years of age and that's your 100%, okay? So in 10 to 12 age group, there is no 10, there is no 11 for males. All males are just 12 years of age. Therefore, there is no standard deviation, okay? In females, if you see, in females, your mean is 11.9 and the standard deviation is really, really tiny. It is just 0 0.27, okay? Um, therefore, if you see the standard deviation error bar over here is also really tiny, okay? So, yep. Uh, so, again, there are 13 females over here. You can uh, see from here, there are 13 females, okay? Um, one is 11 year of age and 12 females are 12 years of age. So if you had, if it was a case like males where all, tw all 13 females were only 12 years of age, then you would not have a error bar standard deviation over here as well, but that is not the case. Over here, you have a little standard deviation because the age is varying within the female age group, okay, 10 to 12 years. All right, so I hope this makes sense. Okay, that is why there is no error bar. All right, but this is how you need to study the graph very closely when you're interpreting it in real life research papers, okay? All right, then you have something called as line graph. So line graph, they are similar to bar charts. The again, the difference is it is represented as line, just like how you had histogram and polygon. They are two sides of the same coin. Similarly, you have bar charts and line graphs, uh, two sides of the same coin, okay? Generally used to display mean, yes, uh, with and without error bar, but again, the same thing applies like for bar chart. It is not impossible to display, for example, your medians and your confidence intervals. Uh, so it is possible, okay? But generally, yes, it is used to display your means, all right? Uh, then, um, what does it say? Bar chart by studying stand, uh, standard deviation error, the presence of an outlier. Yeah, again, this is the same thing that um, this can give you an indication of an outlier when you look at the error bar of the standard deviation but best confirm this with box plot, okay? All right, so, oh yes, um, I think I have emphasized this enough. I have even written it over here, box plot are ideal for estimating outliers. Yep, yes, they are. Okay, so again over here, if you see this is line chart, this is how a line chart looks. This is with and without error bar. So this one is say without error bars, so this is with error bar. So you have male and female, and you have a mean age of participants. For males, it is 14, with, for females, it is 13. All right, with the decimals. But if you see over here, you have the standard deviation error bar. Okay, so hope that makes sense. It is pretty self-explanatory. 
All right, then you have cluster line charts. Cluster line charts is again where you have divided the age into your three categories, 10 to 12, th uh, 13 to 15, and 16 to 18, all right? And this is for males and females again. So your blue line is for males and your green line is for females. Everything which has its mean age uh, reported in those white boxes, okay? And uh, yes, over here you have it with your error bars, okay, which is your standard deviation bar, all right? And um, and what else did I, I, I wanted to tell you? Yes, one just one more thing, which we saw that over here, if you see automatically, because males, we saw that in males, all of the males, which were 16 of them, they were 12 years of age. So there is no mean age displayed over here as such. Uh, but if you want to display it for graphical reason, and then of course you, you would be following this with an explanation in your result that with our male sample, uh, it was such a case that all of them were just 12 years of age. So you can like uh, write it down in your results when you're writing the results um, and you can have it displayed over here as you know 12 because the mean of 12 is 12, obviously there is like no mean as such, okay? But that is why it is not showing up over here. But if you want, you can actually manually have a box in it and you can write it, okay? So you can make those edits uh, followed by justification and reasoning in your results, okay? All right, so um, now again, line chart uh, without, uh, with outliers and error bars. Okay, so your outliers, as I said, these are your error bars. And as you know, error bars are a depiction of outliers. Okay, uh, but now as you can see over here, uh, you may just have to estimate that maybe because this error bar looks um, uh, really big, the dispersion looks really, um, say, wide. Let me investigate this case further. Um, so that's why my best practice is when I have a data set and when I'm screening the data set for these things, I first of all, I do a histogram, uh, which is then followed by a box plot. And then I check all the normalities and then I make a decision of what do I do with the outliers. Okay, but that is my best practice. Um, bar charts, I represent only if I have such, um, say, meaningful data, which I actually want to show uniquely, all right? And with bar chart, it is not just simple things like males and females. For example, if I want to show um, that um, um, males had, say, higher vitamin D intake than females, uh, so this kind of things can be shown by bar chart. And yes, that is when I use bar chart. So I'm just sharing with you my, say, um, research experience as to when do I use these things, okay? So I hope that makes sense. Uh, then you have your yeah, cluster line bar chart. Cluster, again, you know, cluster is for categorical. So you have your three categories over here. You have the mean age over here on y-axis. Okay, and then uh, this is this line, this black line is just to show you uh, that this is where the data is because I just wanted to show you clearly, that's why. Okay, so yes, so your blue is for uh, males and this is for females. So as you see, over here, I manually added the 12, okay? So 12 is my mean age for males. As we know, there was like no other um, age. It was just 12. Females, it was 11.92. And similarly like that you have for other groups. And now if you see, it says with outlier, it does not really give you an outlier number. Just with the, um, say, with the dispersion of the error bar, you then have to investigate the case further, okay? All right, then pie charts. Again, pie charts, they are not really used frequently. I haven't used it once in my career in any of my papers. Uh, but yeah, you can only display one variable at the time, like age or uh, anything, just one. Okay, education of your participants, like and you may have four categories of education. Okay, it is very descriptive. You can't really denote uh, means and standard deviations and things like that um, easily. So um, pie charts, not very frequently used in nutrition sciences, but of course, if you had very simple descriptive epidemiological data, like for example, um, causes of infant mortality rate, uh, say 20% are dying from communicable diseases such as diarrhea, pneumonia, um, typhoid, malaria, all of that. Those things are easy to depict and yes, that is when it is used. So in epidemiology, descriptive epidemiology, yes, uh, pie charts are used. Uh, but when you are doing more complex um, analysis with say bivariate and multivariate um, data sets, you don't really use pie charts, okay? All right, then you have scatter plots. Uh, so uh, we um, have a reviewed regression 
and regression um, again can be represented the uh, data from regression can be represented using scatter plots so again scatter plots is when uh, it gives you the relationship between two continuous variables okay so both of your variables should be continuous if you want to do a scatter plot all right and um, uh, for instance um, yes uh, this is an example which i have taken over here that you have phytate to calcium ratio and calcium intake okay so what is the relationship between uh, say calcium intake and then your blood phytate to calcium ratio okay this is what is the ratio is just an fyi uh, but yes so basically your independent variable over here is um, the individual's calcium intake and then what are the blood levels of phytate to calcium ratio phytate to calcium ratio meaning uh, if you have less calcium intake then your phytate levels will be more in your blood in comparison to your calcium that is what it means phytate to calcium ratio okay if you have very good adequate calcium intake then your phytate to calcium ratio will be in balance which is what we want to see okay so if you have a inverse association between phytate to calcium ratio and calcium intake which means that the individual is consuming much less amount of calcium okay all right oh yes this is what i have said inverse association when phytate intake goes up calcium intake goes down um uh, it could be phytate intake going up or else it could just be calcium intake when it goes down then your blood levels of phytate to calcium may increase okay all right so yes you have the line of regression and you have positive and negative relationship it is best for me to show this to you in the graph format um in the next slide okay so yep so this is your scatter plot as i said it can show the relationship between two continuous variables all right so you have over here phytate to calcium ratio and you have dietary calcium okay so dietary calcium as it decreases your phytate to calcium ratio increases meaning the blood levels of phytate um in comparison to calcium are increasing when your dietary calcium intake is decreasing okay all of these dots are again your individual cases all right so this is or uh, maybe all of these dots in total are say um 80 people okay so these are your 80 participants each dot is one participant okay this black solid line that is called as your line of regression all right so more close these dots are to the black line better is your model okay better goodness of fit all right um, more far away the dots are from your line of regression poor is your model okay you cannot generalize the finding to the wider population all right so this is an indicator of di dispersion the distance between your individual cases and your line of regression all right and uh, this distance is called as say for example error or variance so on and so forth uh, which was covered all right but i hope this makes sense okay so yes regression in regression we use a lot of scatter plots especially when we have interesting relationships to show and if you can see over here um when you do a scatter plot in spss it also gives you the r square a linear regression value okay which is the um basically um, it is this line of regression value it's okay it's a very statistical connotation uh, which um, you don't need to be um, say you don't need uh, this um, right now but please note that um, r square and all of these concepts become very important when you are doing regression by yourself okay so if you are learning quantitative statistics and when you are actually performing a regression on live data sets then yes uh, those um, numbers will be of um, high importance to you okay but i don't want to confuse you any further this is as simple as it can get a scatter plot for continuous variables so it shows relationship between two variables in a relationships can be positive or negative all right this is an inverse association negative relationship okay um these dots are individual cases um and closer the dots to the line of regression better is the model and vice versa and the distance between the dot and the line of regression that is called as your error okay all right so over here again um you can show um one categorical variable in regression you are doing the regression with um say your uh, continuous variables which is your dietary um, calcium intake which is continuous variable your blood phytate to calcium ratio which is again a continuous variable but uh, you know how in regression i said that your um one of your say your independent variables can be continuous or categorical in nature linear regression but your outcome variable always has to be continuous all right okay so over here for instance our outcome variable was 
then we um, are having low calcium intake what is its impact on the blood phytate to calcium ratio right so our outcome variable is your phytate to calcium ratio which is continuous in nature so that is good over here in this table we have or in this graph sorry we have two um, independent variables one is your dietary calcium intake and its impact on phytate to calcium ratio second is vitamin d um, deficiency or sufficiency okay um, and its impact on phytate to calcium ratio because if you are vitamin d deficient then um, there is a greater chance of having high phytate to calcium ratio all right because vitamin d helps in the absorption of calcium but vitamin d is uh, deficient not enough vitamin d um, therefore your calcium is not being absorbed therefore high blood levels of phytate to calcium okay so just to um, give you the context of it all right so yes, vitamin D over here uh, is um, say divided into deficient or sufficient. Okay, so the, for example, the blue line over here, it represents deficiency. The green line represents sufficiency. These are your lines of regression. Okay, and these blue dots represent individuals who are deficient in vitamin D and green ones who are sufficient in vitamin D. Okay, so you see how you can have three variables being represented in a scatter plot. Okay and which could be say categorical in nature as well, all right? But yes, the analysis over here, for instance, um, is between dietary um, calcium and phytate, but you are dividing this data as deficient and sufficient. But yes, when you're doing a linear regression, as I said, you can actually have um, the um, categorical variable included in the model in the analysis. So you can have two independent variables and you want to check their association with phytate to calcium ratio. Okay, so that analysis is possible in regression and in scatter plot, again, you can say, um, show a relationship between these three variables. Okay, and uh, yes, this is your line of regression for deficiency and sufficiency over here. Okay, because there are uh, two things which you wanted to check out for deficient group and for sufficient group. Okay, so basically this model uh, in regression, we say this model is, um, say you want to see an interaction between say these two variables and deficiency sufficiency but i don't want to confuse you with that uh, just remember that scatter plot um, as we um, let me just revise this for you scatter plot relationship between two continuous variables that is the most common phenomena okay um, so which is like phi to calcium and calcium intake all right and you can have inverse relationship you can have a positive relationship and you have line of regression Okay, uh, sorry, sorry, line of regression. And then you can have uh, the um, these individual cases and the distance between the individual case and the say um, the line of regression that is called as your error. This is a much more complex case, but I just wanted to share with you that you can show relationship between three variables and even if they are not categorical in nature, but for you, the simplistic thing is what I have covered in this slide this slide and this slide that much is that is more than enough for you okay um, this is just an fyi that there could be such complicated cases as well all right then you have the stem and leaf plot so stem and leaf plot is um, say similar to histogram okay where um, say basically in um, over here the leaves um, they are like your histogram uh, those charts okay those bars in your histogram uh, in stem and leaf plot, this is represented as uh, leaves and not as those bars. Okay, again, not uh, very widely used in, uh, say, nutritional health sciences. We just go for histograms. Okay, but um, yes, um, yes, I've written not widely used in health sciences. You can list all of the values over here, and it is used to represent frequency of counts. So what do I mean by that? Let me show you a live example. Okay, so for example, you have weights of 10 individuals, hypothetical example. Okay, all of these are the weight of your individuals. Now you arrange the weight in ascending order. So from 65 to 95, the weight is arranged in ascending order. Okay, then uh, you see that uh, the data, uh, then you take the first number of each. So six, six and five, the first number is six and nine and five, the first number is nine. Okay, so the data ranges from six to nine. Uh, the stem is arranged from six to nine and all of the other numbers are leaf. What does that mean? It means, for example, your stem is six to nine, okay? six and five, 65, and six and nine, 69. So if we go above, you had your 65 and your 69. Okay, oh yes, I've written it over here as well. Okay, six and five, 65, six and nine, 69. And this is how you have all of your numbers in the same same model. Okay, in the same, um, say graph, not model, graph. Okay, this is how stem and leaf plot looks in SPSS. 
Okay, so uh, for example, this represents a frequency of um, say uh, participants age. So seven participants are of um, age 20. All right, so if you count the zeros, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so seven participants are 20 years of age. This is what it means. And if you see the um, histogram now is like in a vertical format rather than it being in a horizontal format, okay? Um, but yes, as I said, this is not very widely used in health sciences, uh, especially in nutritional sciences. Now you have the QQ plot. Again, this is useful for assessing normality, which has been explained earlier. So if you see over here, the more closer the um, cases are to the, um, say, not the line of regression, but yes, uh, this is your, say, uh, the, um, the model line, okay? Um, that is a better, um, say, model, meaning it is highly likely that this data would be normally distributed. But if you have, um, say, uh, dots which are very far away from the line, meaning there is greater area, greater variance, greater uh, dispersion, and uh, this may indicate that the data may not be normally distributed and which can be in, um, then investigated with further normal distribution testing. Okay, so this is what your QQ plots are. So mother's age is normally distributed. Um, the blood levels of vitamin D, this requires further investigation. Then you have uh, PP plots or uh, OGIF. Um, so basically it's the same kind of plots. So again, you can do it in SPSS. Mother's age, as you can see, is normally distributed. It is very close to um, the model fit line, all right? Then you have your, um, say, blood serum levels of vitamin D. Um, so this, as you can see, there is um, deviation, okay? And we would need further investigation for this variable, all right? Now, how to interpret tables? Now, as um, I have explained students that there is only so much I can cover, say, um, as a lecturer um, in explaining to you interpretation of tables and graphs. Uh, please follow this, um, say, tutorial with an activity where you're actually picking up tables and graphs from research papers and trying to interpret it. Okay, so now uh, let's look at this, um, say, example table. I tried to select a complicated table so it is, um, so it can become a valuable experience for your learning. All right, so this shows you percent change in physical activity of um, office workers, okay? So you have, um, say, office workers who were um, in the old building previously, all right? So people who are office workers and who were in the old building, old building was not very ergonomically friendly, physical activity friendly. Now you have this modern, new, uh, contemporary design um, building, and the same office workers are now shifted to this new building. And this new building has a lot of ergonomical uh, profile with um, amazing stairs and whatnot and things to increase and to promote physical activity among office workers, okay? So what is reported over here, so these blue things are what is what we are going to interpret. Sorry, the boxes have shifted for some reason. Okay, so basically um, what I wanted to show you in this is, this is what it means. So we are going to investigate intensity levels, sedentary behavior levels, okay? and then we are going to investigate a stair use. All right, so let me just uh, see if this, be, is, is, this is being shared properly. Yes, it is. Okay, I'll just again do a full view. Sorry, I, I didn't want you to be confused. So I thought I'll correct it right now. So these are the three things we are going to interpret. So as you can see what the researcher has reported, has reported uh, the means and the standard deviations, okay, which is in bracket. All right, they have also reported the 95% confidence interval. So you know how I said you can report mean with the standard deviation or else you can report mean with the confidence interval. This researcher has reported both of the things, means with standard deviations and with their confidence intervals, okay, which is not wrong. They can do it, all right? I mean, no, they can do it, meaning um, anybody can do that. It is not a wrong practice. And then you have your p-values over here. All right, so let's um, take one one chunk of this and let's try to um, um, go through this. So you can know that what detail and precision is required and you can see over here N is equal to 42, meaning there are 42 participants who were there in this study. They were first in the older building and you checked their uh, physical activity, sedentary behavior uh, levels, and then they shifted to the new building and you are checking the same thing. And all these 42 people are office workers. Okay, so sedentary job. Um, sitting for long hours and giving lectures like me, okay? All right, so um, yep, uh, let's uh, see this first one. So this first one over here, um, and over here I've just uh, given you a question like this, okay? So um, basically something like this you can have in your assessment items. 
I may give you a table and I may give you four options with interpretation and you have to select the most appropriate interpretation of that table. Similarly, I may give you a graph um, and then I may give you four options and then you have to select, to select the most um, appropriate interpretation of the graph, okay? So similarly over here, how will you briefly describe the findings for intensity level? So this is intensity level. Blue box is, you know, in the earlier slide, I showed you just the blue box, which we corrected, all right? And support your uh, description appropriate statistics, which are provided, uh, but you don't have to write like this in exam. I would be writing the interpretation. You have to select the most appropriate interpretation. Okay, so now you have intensity level, which is measured in minutes per day, okay? Um, intensity of physical activities, what do they mean? All right, so intensity level is sedentary, um, level light, moderate, and vigorous uh, physical activity. All right, during the office space in the um, old versus new building. So this is for the old building. This is for the new building. This is the p-value, okay? And we know this represents means and standard deviation. These are the confidence intervals which are written and the same thing follows, all right? Now you see the interpretation which I have given is on average, all right? Why do I say the term on average? Now see each and every term is so important. And that's why you have to pay very close attention when I give you a table like this to interpret with four options, read, read each and every word which I have written in your options, okay? I have said on average because it is means are reported. When means are reported, they are an indicator of central tendency and means are nothing but average. Okay, so on average, sedentary activity levels. So now I'm talking about this variable. Okay, sedentary activity levels and sedentary activity is recorded in minutes per day. That's why you have minutes per day over here. So you see how each and every word has a meaning and it is taken from the table. So on average, sedentary acti activity levels in minutes per day was significantly lower. Now, very, very important, remember the thumb off rule. When we write, um, say, statistically significant or significant, when we use these terminologies in epidemiology, significant or significantly or statistically lower, this means that p-value has to be less than 0.05. All right, we cannot use the term significant, statistically significant, and um, say, uh, yes, uh, significantly, if it was not P less than 0 0.05, okay? So when I say significantly lower, meaning I'm telling you the P is, P is less than 0 0.05, all right? And which is the case? If you see over here, we are looking at sedentary, look at the P value, it is 0 0.001, it has a star also, star indicates it is a significant finding, okay? Some tables may have stars, some may have not have stars. You just have to closely study the p-value, okay? So I'm saying it is significantly lower for office employees after moving to the new building, okay? So in the new building, the sedentary activity levels, minutes per day is 381. So it is 381.68, all right? I have reported the means and standard deviations. I haven't reported the confidence intervals. That is completely fine, okay? So there is nothing wrong with that, with this interpretation, all right? So yes, um, the sedentary activity levels were, um, say, lower for office employees once they were in the new building, which is ergonomically designed and whatnot. In comparison to their sedentary activity levels, again, minutes per day in the old building, which is over here, 401.30, so on and so forth. Okay, and I have reported the findings with the p-value. Does that make sense? Okay, this is how each and every word in the statement has a meaning, a connotation, which has been taken from the table. This is how you interpret tables, okay? You have to pay very close attention, all right? Now, similarly, let's look at the um, intensity levels for light one, okay? So on average, now you know why the term average is used. Uh, light activity levels, so light, okay? Activity levels recorded in minutes per day was significantly higher. Now you know why I'm using significant, meaning the P is less than 0 0.05 for office employees after moving to the new building. Okay, so new building over here is 57, all right, minutes per day, okay, in comparison to the light activity levels in the old building. So in the old building, it was 35 minutes per day, light activity, okay? So the difference between 57 minutes per day and 35 minutes per day is of statistical significance, all right? Um, an individual if or a researcher, if they just write um, moving to the new building is um, higher than the older building. Yes, it is high or low, but is it of statistical significance or is it significantly higher or low? 
for using this term, you need to have p value less than 0 0.05, okay? I hope that makes sense. All right, then you have bouts. Um, so bouts meaning a short span of really um, intense physical activity. So um, some individuals um, who are um, say working a lot uh, with desk job, they may just uh, say devote 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes of just um, say um, 20 squats, um, like, you know, means in 20 seconds or something like that. All right. Um, so yes, uh, very, very rapid short spurts of intense physical activity. Those are called bouts, okay? So let's see the average length of bouts, okay? So why do I say length of bouts? Because it is reported in length of bouts, all right? And it is average, average length of bouts, okay? The average length of bouts, and this is in minutes, okay? Was significantly higher, significant, now you know why, for office employees after moving to the new building, which is 20 minutes, all right? So over here, if you see average length of bouts, Average length of bouts, then you have minimum length of bouts, maximum length of bouts. But the average length of bouts, which is of 20 minutes, average 20 minutes of bout exercises, if you want to say. All right. So this was significantly higher after moving to the new building in comparison to the old building 18. You, uh, This is what I'm saying. If you just use higher and lower, you may think 20 is not really that different from 18. But if you do a statistical test and if this comes out to be significantly different, then yes, this is of importance, okay? So I hope this is easy for now, uh, for you to interpret. First, the table was looking really overwhelming, but you have to break it down into small manageable pieces, any table, and this helps you with your interpretation, all right? Now let's look at the maximum length of bouts, okay? So the maximum length of bouts, which is this one, maximum length of bouts, now we know it is recorded in minutes, was significantly higher, okay, why? Because this is p-value less than 0 0.05 for office employees after moving to the new building, which is this one, 60 minutes, in comparison to their maximum length of bouts in the old building, all right, which is 49 minutes, all right? Okay, and this is also significantly different, okay? Maybe, um, I don't know how practically um, can these people um, devote 60 minutes of intense physical activity when they are having an office work. I mean, I have a lot of office work. I wish I could do that. But anyways, this is a study, all right? And maybe people do that, which is fantastic and amazing. All right, but yes, as you see that there is a significant difference between say, people having uh, the maximum length of bouts in the new building versus older building, okay? So again, isn't this becoming much more um, easier to understand and comprehend? This is how you have to say, break down your values to make more sense, all right? Then you have a stair use, okay? So now let's look at stair use. Um, see, over here, what I've written, there was no significant difference between the new building, okay? And you know the new building data is over here, all right? And which is 3.47, okay? 3.47 is this one, all right? And the, oh, <coughs> sorry, and the old building, 2.97 reported with means and standard deviation with reference to office employee stair use. Okay, so which is stair use, which is number of times per day. So you see how I have been so detailed about my description. So number of times per day, stair use. Okay, so I've clearly told you that and there was no significant difference. All right. So yes, there was no significant difference between new building, old building, um, stair use, number of times, per day, okay? So this is how I have taken all of these words to make the statement, all right? Similarly, there was no significant difference between the new building, all right, which is over here, your new building is 3.97 and your old building 3.84 with reference to office employees. And I tell you with reference to not just floor uh, levels, office employees. So I want to uh, indicate the target group as well, all right? Floor levels, so floor levels is this level traveled is floor levels, okay? So the number of floors that they have climbed up the stairs, okay? Floor levels traveled per day, okay? This is per day, meaning uh, they um, they um, say they traveled two floors, three, four floors, five floors, how many floors, okay? Per day, all right? Which makes sense. Like imagine if you're working on level two, uh, why would you just randomly keep traveling between levels in between work? Okay, so um, that's why maybe there is no significant difference. 
All right, but it would be very different in an academic setting, especially when you have face-to-face -face lectures where you are running between classrooms, um, between buildings. Okay, over there, you do not have one designated place to work. You're just running between, uh, say, classrooms and campuses to be taking your lecture. That is a different story. Okay, but over here, this is of not significance. But I hope now you understand and you appreciate how you have to critically make use of all of these words in writing interpretation and interpreting it correctly. Okay, so you will have these sort of interpretations which are written for you, and then you will have to interpret them. Okay, uh, meaning you have to identify the most accurate interpretation from the options provided in your assessments. Okay. All right, so um, as um, I have, um, when I started this lecture, I said that you have to appreciate there are say a million and one tables out there and graphs out there. And I cannot really um, say, uh, explain all of them to you, but um, I have given you the basic fundamental knowledge of what to use, when, and why it is used. All of those rational and logics to you are clear. Now what would be useful is for you to go um, back for your tutorial activity, take three research papers, at least one of them who's reporting some sort of a graph, all right? And then try to interpret those tables and graphs and uh, then read the results section of the paper because in the results section, see if your interpretation is correct and similar to what the results section says about that table, okay? So that will help you to make a meaningful, um, say, um, use of this lecture and to see whether what you have studied, whether you were able to understand and apply the knowledge correctly. Okay. So this is a take home activity, which you have to do. Of course, I'm not going to check it or anything. So don't worry. It doesn't have any marks, but this is for your own learning. A lot of postgraduate skills are say, not just your um, safe um, uh, formative assessments where you get marks and things, but some of these are like this, which do not have marks but they are for your own learning and growth. So please make use of this time and select articles and try to use this knowledge in interpreting the tables and graphs correctly in your own research papers, in your own area of practice. Okay, so yep, uh, that's it from my end, um, students, and um, I'll see you shortly in your next lecture and So thank you for your time.